Hello and welcome to uh, another special episode, uh, uh, Footprints of God series. We've been going each month through the Footprints of God series. Um, today is on Mary, Our Lady, and um, yeah, we this has been an amazing journey with Steve Ray, who's been uh, to the Holy Land so many times, 180 times we've, we've learnt uh, to the spot where Mary has been and just been phenomenal. Who, who, who has done it more than him? I don't think there's been anyone on the planet that's been back to the Holy Land that many times. Um, but uh, we're going to learn if there's anyone that can talk about her, it is him. And we're going to, I'm super excited about it. We're on the back of the Rosary Pilgrimage, we're now, we've, um, we're in November, we're getting ready for Advent, the coming of the Messiah. And let's, before we welcome Jesus, let's welcome Mary. So this is quite, quite exciting and the timing is so providential. So let's uh, cross over live to Steve right now. Hello, Steve. How are you doing? Hello, Charbel. Doing very good. And i um, just waiting for Trump to make the announcement that uh, we have the same president for another four years. So That's right. We are all praying, uh, um, praying, praying for that. Uh, yeah, so we're only hours away from the moment of this uh, this stream. So, uh, yeah, we, we'll keep praying. And my goodness, it's been so uh, phew, um, amazing to watch uh, from uh, on the other side of the world, the, the American elections. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's been quite uh, an adventure. <laughs> it's been quite quite exciting. Yeah, you, it is. You, um, uh, you, yeah, 180 times you've been to Mary's place. Where Mary has been, or is it the Holy Land in general? I've been to Israel at least 180 or more times. That doesn't wow. count to Iraq and Syria and Jordan and all the other places. And I've been to the places where Mary was in Egypt, too, when they fled. There's a, there's a great strong tradition there of the places. In fact, there was a Jewish community in, in the Cairo area. And uh, if you watch that movie on Mary, I take you down into the place where the Holy Family lived while they were in Egypt. Um, yes. I also went to Turkey because she lived there in Ephesus with John. And um, the movie that I made there that you showed, I end up on the island of Greece on the island of Patmos because from Patmos, the end of the Bible, John is in a cave looking up and he says, behold, I saw the woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet. And I'm sitting right where John was when he got that revelation of Mary, the queen of heaven. So yeah, we've, we've done it a few times. But to Nazareth, uh, where Mary spent most of her time, let's face it, she was there the, uh, the 30 years, the 30 silent years, we call them. And she was there as a young girl, too. So, uh, yeah, I've been to Nazareth many, many times. My best friend over there lives in Nazareth, so we spend a lot of time there when we're in Israel. Wow. Wow. Well, so very excited. I mean, we've, we've journeyed through the whole Old Testament. Here we are right at, the, at the end now. We're, we're now coming up to the New Testament. Um, uh, we've gone all the way. You've, you've went right from Adam all the way up to this point. It's been quite exciting to see uh, the connection and, and the, I guess, the foreshadowing of Christ. And now uh, Mary is quite a, a, I mean, obviously a key person, and, and we we overlook it. But but her birth, her life, how she lived, all that we're going to dive into a bit. Um, but where do we start, uh, Steve, uh, to dive into her and and I imagine John the Baptist as well. Uh, uh, two key figures before Christ came on the scene. Well, let's make the point first that they are neither Old Testament nor New Testament, really, although we okay. hear, we read about them in the New Testament, is they're really intertestamental. That means they're in between the two Testaments. Both Mary and John are two pillars that are there. The last of the prophets spoke 400 years before the coming of Jesus. We have the Maccabees and so on, but the, the last of the prophets spoke, and there was 400 years of silence. Everybody's waiting for something to happen. They knew it was going to happen all the way back in Genesis from the Garden of Eden. There was the promise of Genesis 3.15, I will bring enmity between you and the woman and between you, her, your seed and her seed. And uh, so that, what does that mean? That there's yes. going to be something coming and it has to do with a woman and it has to do with her seed. This, of course, is a prophecy of the Virgin Mary coming, and her seed would be Jesus, who would crush the head of Satan, and Satan would bruise his heel, which is the crucifixion, of course, but his head's going to get crushed. He gets the worst of the deal. Um, I've stepped on more than one snake's head, and I know if you do that, it's, they're done, and um, that's what Jesus <laughs> did to the devil. He stomped on his head, and um, so we're, we know that there's going to also be some guy coming who is like Elijah, we talked about that last month. 
And the last prophet, Malachi, said that before the great and coming day of the Lord, there's going to be Elijah's going to return. And Jesus said that John the Baptist was that Elijah. He came in the spirit and the power of Elijah, dressed the same way, of course, with camel hair and a leather belt. The only two guys ever mentioned that way. And so you have these two people in the middle of the two testaments were already prepared for both of them. The Old Testament already warned us that they're coming. Also in uh, Isaiah 7, 14, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. You shall call his name Emmanuel. And Micah chapter 5, verse 2 and 3 tells us you, it's going to be in Bethlehem, which wow. is why, of course, Mary and Joseph had to go to Bethlehem. The, the emperor of Rome didn't realize that when he called that census, that he was really fulfilling the, the word of God because Mary and Joseph had to get from Nazareth down to uh, Bethlehem, which was, by the way, a hundred miles of uh, walking or riding a stupid donkey, whichever, they're both bad. Um, so you have the prefiguration, they're coming, they've been prophesied, and John the Baptist appears. He is in the wilderness. He is born, by the way, to 100% Aaronic priesthood. Aaron, the high priest, the brother of Moses, he was the mm. high priest of Israel. In order to be a priest, you had to be in the family of Levi to be servants and priests, but to be high priests, those that could serve in the temple, you had to be with the blood of Aaron. Zechariah mm. and Elizabeth, both were 100% pure blood Aaronites. They had the blood of Aaron. So John the Baptist is 100% Aaronic priesthood, so that's why it says that he anointed Jesus when he went down for his baptism. Jesus was anointed because John the Baptist is of the priestly tribe. Mm. Now, so you have him down in the wilderness. He's preparing the way. He is prophesying, saying there's one going to come and he's going to, I'm not going to be worthy to tie his shoes or sandals. And then uh, up in the north, in Nazareth, a young girl, 15 years old, that's roughly, we guess, 14, 15, 16 years old. She has been specially prepared for this. We don't have time. Uh, I mean, the, the whole thing about non, the non-biblical story of, of her birth is fascinating, but we could do, you know, half an hour just on that alone. And we got to go all the way from Nazareth to Jerusalem, all the way through Mary's life in Cana and Ein Karim and Ephesus. All, we got to get to heaven by the end of tonight because that's where she ends up as the queen. And how we're going to do that in an hour, I really don't know unless I start talking much faster than I'm talking now. <laughs> but um, let, let me just recap. How, we know how John the Baptist was born. And his father was uh, deaf and dumb. Some people, it, it says dumb, but there's implication that he's also was deaf mm. because he, they did sign language to him because uh, it appears he couldn't hear. So they did sign language to him about what they're going to call the, the new baby. Um, but we don't know from the Bible about Mary's birth. But in early second century, there's a document called the Proto-Evangelium of James. I know that's a big, scary name. Proto means first, evangelium means good news, the gospel, the first good, not good news of James. It was written probably, or at least it was written down, the, probably the story was there, but it may be written down in the first half of the second century. So very close to the events. And it tells the story of the birth of Mary, the betrothal to Joseph, and the birth of Jesus. Very interesting reading, by the way. You can read it in 15 minutes. And Mary's parents were named Joachim and Anna, but those names aren't in the Bible. We learned those names from the Proto-Evangelium of James. That's where we get those names. And the fact that Mary was consecrated to the temple, we also get that, that when we celebrate the, um, the uh, when Mary goes to the temple there, the dedication of the temple, um, that's that is uh, from that document as well. Wow. Nobody's saying that it's 100% accurate or that, and it's not scripture, but it's a historical document from which the Catholic Church has taken great um, respect and learned a lot from. Well, in that story, it says that Zechariah, I mean, Joachim and, and uh, Joachim and Anna could not have children. They were kicked out of the temple because they must be something wrong with you. You must be a sinner if God hasn't blessed you with children, so there must be something wrong. And so they wouldn't let them come to the temple with their sacrifice. So they prayed. Zechariah went out 
I keep thinking of John the Baptist. Yeah. <laughs> Joachim went out into the desert and he prayed, he said, I'm not going home till I get an answer to my prayer. Anna went into the garden and she watched the birds laying, making a nest and laying their eggs and the baby birds hatching. And she says, why is it that the birds can have babies, but you don't give me? I'm your daughter. I've lived for you. Why is it that I can't have a child? So God says, this time next year, you'll have a child. And to both of them, the angel came and said that. And a, a year later, Mary was born. But the deal was that she had to give, she pledged, she made a vow to give the girl to the service of the Lord in the temple, very much like Samuel. Mm -hmm. And when she was born, Mary didn't want to give her up right away. I can understand that. But also women back then breastfed their babies for up to three years. It was just the way it was. Right. You, you couldn't go to the drugstore and get formula, <laughs> a bottle to stick in their mouth, you know. Um, so they had, they had to nurse. And the story is that Joachim and Anna kept the baby for three years. Anna breastfed her. And then she took her to the temple says that the holy women carried her everywhere because they didn't want her to touch the ground. Why? Because there were all these animals around and no plumbing. And can you imagine what the city of Jerusalem was like with camels and donkeys and sheep everywhere? It must have been filthy. So the yes. women carried her around. And then when May, they finally took her to the temple to dedicate her to the Lord, it says they set her on the third step and she danced and everyone loved her. And they took her into the temple and she was fed by the angels in preparation before the Ark of the Covenant, before the presence of God. She was prepared to become the mother of God. And I'll close that section of her life with this. When she was around 11, 12 years old, when the menstruation cycle would kick in, then she would be rendered ceremonially unclean to be in the temple. That was part of the ceremonial law. And I think at that point, her family moved up to Nazareth, and that's where she ended up meeting the angel. The only thing we didn't talk about is her actual birth, and we can talk about that if you want to, And that because in tied in there is the Immaculate Conception. Yeah, what, yes, what about that? So um, it's very interesting. We do say that uh, when people think of Immaculate Conception, many people make the false uh, or they, they mix it with the birth of Christ, thinking that, He's born without sin, and they, they think it's the incarnation. Well, no, no, it's yep. not that. It's not the Annunciation or incarnation. It's Mary, Mary yep. born without sin, and and was conceived even without sin. So, can you explain a bit about that? Yeah, we could talk a whole hour about that, but we won't. But, um, there's a church in Jerusalem. We try to get there with our group. Sometimes time doesn't allow, but I think when we go back with your group in yes. uh, 2022. I think it's in February or April. I got to look that up again. I, I think it's probably April. I think it is April uh, 2022. We should have more time because there won't be any lines. People will still be afraid to go. Yes. And we're going to go and we're going to own the city. The whole country will be ours. Nobody will be in our <laughs> way. We won't have to. So we'll have more time to do more things, which is going to be very nice. And we'll visit a church called the Church of St. Anne, her mother. And when you walk in, there's a beautiful statue there of Anne sitting and Mary standing there talking to her mother and with her arm around her with her daughter, Mary. It's a very beautiful picture. Uh, it's a white marble statue. But then there's a sign over to the right and there's a stairway going down. You read the sign. It says the nativity. You think it's going to say of our Lord, but it says the nativity of Our Lady. Mm -hmm. And you go down and from early tradition, that's the place where Mary was born in that grotto. And if that's the case, then that was the place where the Immaculate Conception happened. The Immaculate uh -huh. Conception, of course, was a grace given to Mary, not required for her to do what she did, but it was a grace that was commensurate or appropriate, Thomas Aquinas says, for the monumental task that God had asked her to do. And um, when he asked her, would you do this? She gave her fiat, meaning, yes, I will. I'll do that. Now, there was a great moment of sorrow, I think, for Mary. We don't realize that. Mary had a lot of sorrows that we don't even know of. There is the devotion of the seven Dolorosas, the seven sorrows, the losing of Jesus mm -hmm. in the temple, the crucifixion, so on. But, but I think when, when the angel told her that she was going to give birth to the king, he was going to sit on the throne of her father, David, and Mary says, but I don't know a man. And I, I'm not married yet. Now, I always get a flack from this. She was, in, she was betrothed, which means she was legally on paper 
the marriage had taken place, but they had not moved in together yet. So there was, the marriage was two parts. There yes. was first the betrothal, the family. It was a religious, actually, even in, you know, in your country today, Lebanon, if yes. you go up with those folks, the uh, engagement is not just a boy asking a girl to marry him. The engagement is a very serious matter, and it takes place before the priest. That's the uh, the betrothal. And it's a pledge. It's a it's a pledge, but they're not married yet in the sense of living today. A year later or so, the husband, the boy comes and gets his bride and then takes him her to his house. Then, and in in, in I've been to these weddings in uh, Nazareth, and they the the boy comes, the young man comes and gets the girl. They go to the actual to a mass, and they're married. Very simple, and then they go off on their honeymoon. Now both parts, betrothal and mass, are together, and they're married. So Mary says, I don't know a man, even though she's betrothed, she's not married yet. And even Joseph is concerned when he finds out that she is with child. Well, how did that happen? We, what, what happened? But Mary said, I don't know a man. And that's a very strange answer for a young girl who plan. If you would assume that the girl's going to get married and have a husband yes. and have children, you would assume that she'd say, oh, good. Well, I expected to have lots of children. You mean one of them is going to be the son of God, the king of yeah. Israel? But <laughs> Mary point. didn't say that. She says, uh, but I don't know a man, which implies quite strongly that she had planned to be a, uh, a virgin, that she was not going yeah. to have sexual relations. And that must have been something that her and Joseph had agreed on. And in um, in Numbers, I think it's Numbers chapter 30, there's a provisions made for a young lady to make vows like that, by the way, in case people said, well, they wow. wouldn't have done that. Well, yes, go back and read your Old Testament. So anyway, they um, Mary now is born, but we are told that she has of the immaculate conception. She was from the moment of her conception without the stain of original sin, a grace that God gave her. And I think that back to that thing about why I think it was a sorrow, I don't want to leave you hanging there, is because for a young girl to get pregnant out of wedlock in Israel without having married and moved in with her husband, she would be stoned to death. That was the penalty for becoming with child without doing it yes. properly. And can you imagine that when Mary said yes to the angel, she knew she was going to become the figure of ridicule wow. and gossip. And when she said yes, she knew that in this small village of 250 people uh, where she lived in Nazareth, to say yes to a question like that was to set herself up for a very uncomfortable situation. And I think that she knew that. Anyway, there's so much about Mary that you don't yeah. know unless you go to the land and you sit and you think and meditate on it and you understand the people. That's why the context, the historical, the cultural context is so important because you under you have to understand that more. Well, anyway, Absolutely. now she's the Immaculate Conception. But I but Charbel, don't you remember in the Bible where it says in Romans that all have sinned? How That's can Mary right. be in a how can she be immaculate conception and, and having never sinned if the Bible says that uh, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? M many of our Protestant uh, brothers and sisters raise that. Yeah, that's right. So all of how them do we do. respond? Not only that, do they raise it? They love to dance on it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's very simple. Of course, Mary needed a savior. In my movie, I make a puddle of mud and I'm walking towards the puddle of mud and there's a big log in front of the mud puddle. And I say, we have a problem because Mary said, I rejoice in God, my savior. So Mary needs a savior. I thought only sinners need saviors. And right then I say, but there are two ways to be saved from a puddle of mud. And I trip and I fall headfirst into that mud puddle. And at that moment, I say, Mary did need a savior, but her save, she was saved in another way. I'm, I'm looking for a picture here because I have a picture of me falling in the mud there. I see if I can oh, find it. That's classic. It. Um, <laughs> on, on the DVD. Um, I love how you get your hands dirty. You get your body dirty in this case. <laughs> yeah, this this is a, uh, maybe you could see it. That's me <laughs> falling head first into the mud puddle. And that's what I look like uh, when the camera comes down and goes down on me. See that? <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> I love iPhones. Anyway, so I say when that mud's all in my face, they pull me up and I say to the camera, there are two ways to be saved from a puddle of mud. The first way is to be pulled up and cleaned off, 
cleaned up, given a bath. Yes. And then it goes, rewinds like a video. And I'm coming at the mud puddle again. I trip and I fall and I don't hit the mud puddle this time. A hand stops me and pushes me back. And I say the second way to be saved from a puddle of mud is to be prevented from falling in in the first place. Mary was a daughter of Eve. She was subject to sin like the rest of us. But by a unique act of God, based on the merits of her son, she was prevented from falling into the mud. Yes, Mary needed a savior. So that is the Immaculate Conception. Now with that illustration, any eight-year-old can explain it. Yeah, absolutely. So Love it. The Catholic Church is really very simple in its theology. It's so simple that if you teach an eight-year-old, the eight-year-old can, can explain it and teach it. But then again, it's, it's um, enough for even to go over the head of a guy like Thomas Aquinas. But anyway, <laughs> so now we have her born and she's yeah. the Immaculate Conception and there's so much more we could say. She's also the Ark of the Covenant and all those things. But we'll get into that maybe if we have time later. And now she is um, with child and she gets the message from the angel. Now, the let's just talk about the angel real quick. The angel yes. comes and tells her that. What was life like for Mary? When I'm in Israel, in Nazareth, I do a half hour talk for everybody. It's called A Day in the Life of the Holy Family. I also have a CD talk on my website for sale called that. And we go through what, what it was like. They lived in a cave, very rustic. I always ask people, what do you think Mary did first thing every morning when she woke up? What do you think people say? She prayed, right? She got up and prayed and, and that was it. Right. And I always ask people, is that the first thing you do in the morning? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, everybody's kind of like shocked. And you can't say that about the Blessed Mother. Well, yes, I can. She was a girl. She was a woman, walked on two feet, dressed like the rest of us did. And she had to get up in the morning and go to the bathroom. So where do you go to the bathroom in the morning when you don't have any plumbing and you live in a cave and you live in a small village of 25 other caves? Well, I'll leave that to your imagination. The book of Deuteronomy tells us what they did. But So that's what the Holy Family did. Very rustic life, very simple life. And going to the well every morning for water. She had to go get water at the well, 15-minute walk. The only water in Nazareth is 15 minutes away. So she had to go walk. Every, and just imagine when she had baby Jesus, every day little guys following her like, Mommy, Mommy, wait for me, wait for me. You know, he's just running, tagging along, chasing her down to the well and back. And um, I always ask young girls in the on the pilgrimage, do you think Mary liked it when she was a young girl? Because men didn't, you know, you and I had never gone and got water. That was the woman's job. The girls went and got the water. I asked the girls, do you think that Mary and the girls in Nazareth liked going down to get the water every day in the well, carrying that jug on her? And they all go, no, she would never like that. And I said, I think she did because guess who's at the well? All the other girls. They didn't have Twitter <laughs> and Facebook and all these uh chat lines. They went to the well to talk. All the girls got, they couldn't wait to get there and talk to their girlfriends about who likes who. And mom was really mean to me today and all these things of girls. And Mary <laughs> was right in the middle of them. Okay. So Mary, now let's get back. She, the, she comes back to her cave and the angel meets her at the cave. I think that she had camel dung between her toes. She's walking in a dirt path where camels and donkeys and sheep go to get water. I lived on a farm. I know what it's like to live on a farm. This was very much farm country, farmland, animals. Mm. And she probably had um, camel dung between her little bare feet. And I have pictures of girls in Nazareth a hundred years ago going to get water at the well. They're all barefoot. They all have jugs on their head. When cameras were first invented, very much like during Mary's time and flies buzzing around her head. And people, wow. you can't talk about the blessed mother like that. Well, yes, we can, because that's the way she really lived. That's the real girl, Mary, not what you see in the statues. That's the real girl, Mary. And so the angel comes and says this to her. And then I think the most important line, and I'll quit on this section, is it says, and then the angel left her. Yes. And here's a 15-year-old here's a girl. How does she process that? That's like a hard drive on a computer going, you just can't process that big data file. Mary didn't know everything. People say, well, she would. No, Mary didn't. Even when she had, they lost Jesus in Jerusalem and they had to go back, she says, why did you do this to your father and I? Yes. Mary pondered these things in her heart. She, And so the angel left her and now she has to 
process this and Mary has to live by faith the same way we do because the angel did not come back every day and meet her at the kitchen table for a cup of coffee and say, Mary, let me give you an update today. Mary now had to step out in faith and trust God, even though she was in very unusual circumstances. So then that is interesting because the way in um, Luke's gospel here in chapter one, this happens. And then the next scene, she, the, the idea of her going and um, visiting her cousin Elizabeth. And you talk about that um, because it sort of changes uh, the scene. And now she's got this long trek ahead of her. So yep. going from the Annunciation, now she's hearing about, hang on, um, her, her cousin now is pregnant and, and she's now pregnant and she goes to help another pregnant woman. Um, can you, should we jump into that? <laughs> yep. That's, she goes to Ein Kerem and I'm going to take you there when we go on the pilgrimage. I can't wait. Ein Kerem is a subdivision of Jerusalem. It's about four or five miles outside to the west of Jerusalem, out in the hill side. The, the priests live there because the priests were very rich. The high priests mm. were very rich at that time. And they would have country homes out in the country away from the smelly fly ridden city of Jerusalem. And this is where Elizabeth and Zechariah lived, about five miles west of Jerusalem. For Mary, people think she jumped in a taxi and drove across town to visit Elizabeth, but actually that was 100 miles she had to walk into the hill country of Judea. And so Mary packs up and goes to the hill country of Judea. I don't think she went to help her cousin, her relative. It doesn't say cousin. It's really the word kins, kinswoman, like a relative of some sort. We don't know. Which leads me to believe that Mary was probably of the priestly line too. Most people want to say that she was of the line of Judah, like Joseph was, the kingly line. But I, I like to think that because she was a relative, a close relative of 100% Aaronic priesthood, obviously she was also from at least part the line of Aaron the high priest. And they were very exclusive in their relations so they kept the blood pure to, to a degree so i like to think that mary provided jesus the priestly blood and joseph was the kingly now she it says that she packs up her she makes haste okay so she packs up her little young girl suitcase thing you know and she she's on her way to visit elizabeth it's not gonna be a hundred miles of walking and when we're on the bus driving there, it's a two-hour drive in a Mercedes air-conditioned bus. I always say to people, and don't forget, Mary is still walking. Mary is still walking. And she... Days. How, yeah, how long was that journey? Well, the understanding is, is that in, in the Middle East during biblical times, that on average, you'd travel 20 miles a day. Um, if days. you were on horses or maybe in a hurry, military, something you could travel 25 or 30. Maybe Jesus and his disciples walking alone could travel 25 miles a day. They're young, they're strong. But uh, Mary would not have gone by herself. It's dangerous. You can't remember the story of the man who went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he got bushwhacked by those guys and the Good Samaritan helped him. You, you, yes. There's wild animals. I've been, I've run all over Israel. I was a runner. I ran all over it. I've, I've run around a corner and there's a hyena standing right in front of me. I'm poisonous snakes, all kinds of things. And um, so Mary would have gone with a caravan or with a group of people, which then would have to find a place to stay every night. They would travel maybe with children and animals, roughly 20 miles in a day. So that would be five days from sun up to sundown just to get to Elizabeth's house. And when she gets down there, it's the hill country of Judea. You'll see that when we go on the pilgrimage. It's really hilly. Wow. And um, so now one point, I, I know that I'm digressing and not talking about the life of Mary here, but just we're having an election here and abortion is one of the big issues. Mary, at, she said it made haste to go. So let's say it took her five days. Didn't take her that long, but say it did take her five days to get ready mm. and then five days to get there. Now she's there with Elizabeth 10 days after the angel told her, how big is the baby in her womb? We always see pictures of Mary. She's big, pregnant, pregnant Mary. It's just coming up the hill, you know, with the, 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 the the baby in her womb was so small. The cells were still so small. You couldn't see it. You'd have to use a microscope to see them. And yet Elizabeth said, the mother of my Lord is here. Mm. She recognized that those few small cells in Mary's womb were 100% yeah. man and 100% God. And those cells were God had become flesh. He had become yeah. flesh the moment the answer God had become flesh in Nazareth. And by the way, in Nazareth, where that happened, the altar, I'll show this to you when we go, the altar said the word became flesh here. 
wow. says it right on the altar. When you go in the grotto, the word became flesh here. That's the incarnation happened in Nazareth, not in Bethlehem. So she gets there. Elizabeth said, the mother of my Lord's come to me. And John the Baptist leaps in his mother's womb because he recognizes that what's in there, what's in Mary's womb is already Jesus Christ, the son of God, 100% human. And then imagine, perish the thought. It's even sacrilegious, it seems to say this. Perish the thought that Mary had said, I'll get an abortion. Well, exactly. Yeah. No. Nah. I only say that to make a point. Yeah, that's right. And she, it, of course, wouldn't do that. It that should shudder you <laughs> right now. It, I it can't imagine. It should scare you half to death. Who, yeah. What babies have been killed? Babies who could have, uh, this, maybe some of the smartest people in the whole world have been aborted. Ones that could have cured cancer, could have done mm. so many wonderful things for mankind, and yet they've all been aborted. Many, uh, anyway, we can't talk on that. We'll do abortion another time. So Mary is now there. The interesting thing is when I'm in Ein Kerem, I do another talk there about the visitation. You know, we're halfway done already, Charbel, and we're not even out of the visitation yet. This is really scary. Anyway, so, but this has to be said. When the angel said to Mary, she said, how will this be? And the angel said, the spirit of God will overshadow you. Now, what do you think Mary thought? Mary knew exactly how many how many Catholics right now think, oh, well, that's Isaiah. Cha I mean, uh, Exodus chapter 40. Why would I say Exodus chapter 40? Because in Exodus 40, it says that when Moses had finished making the Ark of the Covenant, he stood back and the spirit of the Lord overshadowed the Ark with the with the word of God inside of the Ark. When Mary said, how will this be? The angel said, the Holy Spirit of God will overshadow you, and that which is in you will be the holy thing of God. The same thing, see? The same word being used for Mary, Amazing. overshadowing. So Mary already, may, I think, knew she was going to be the queen of heaven. We'll talk about that why. But she also knew, oh, my goodness, I'm going to be the ark of the new covenant. The ark of the old covenant was a gold box about this size, this size. I'm, while I'm talking here, I'm just going to grab something. Here. Yes. This is all in the DVD, um, Mary, by, by Steve Ray, the mother of God, footprints of God, amazing stuff. And there when it is. I, I say to people, this is my statue of Mary. And they say, what do you mean? That's the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> yes, that's what I said. That's my statue of Mary. Why? Because when Mary was on her way to um ein Kerman. when she was there what was in mary's womb well let me go back first it says that she arrived in the hill country of judea mary elizabeth said who am i mother who are you, who am i that the mother of my lord should come to me john the baptist leaps and dances in front of the ark mary stays for three months and everybody is blessed the word blessed is used twice in that passage so how many catholics right now just thought of second samuel chapter six in the old testament unless they knew about it yeah and once in a while, I get in my group, somebody raises their hand because I give this whole talk for a half an hour and I'm careful. Well, the fact is, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And it said he brought the Ark of the Covenant into the hill country of Judea. And it says David danced and leaped in front of the Ark. John the Baptist danced and leaped in front of the new Ark. Yes. They came into the hill country of Judea. Elizabeth said, who am I? No, David said, who am I that the ark of the Lord should come to me? Elizabeth said, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come? Exactly the same words. You just transpose ark of the covenant with mother of my Lord. Yes. First of all, she's saying that Mary, that's God in her womb. And she's also saying that in your womb is you are the ark of the new covenant. She left, David left the ark of the covenant in the hill country of Judea for three months. Mary stayed for three months and everybody in the, Hill country was blessed. Well, do you think that Luke put that together by chance in the visitation? In the story of the visitation, there's a whole other story percolating and bubbling underneath. The story of the Old Testament and Mary being the Ark of the New Covenant. Yes. All of that's there. So anyway, wow. so Mary Amazing. is the Ark. And what was in the Ark of the Covenant? Let's do that. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4, if I remember right. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4, 2, 3, or 4 says that in the Ark of the Covenant, in that gold box in the wilderness, there was the stone tablets of the law, the word of God inscribed in stone. There was manna from the wilderness, and there was a stick that proved the priesthood of Aaron. Three things. Now, what's in Mary's womb? 
the word of God inscribed not in stone, but in flesh. She doesn't yeah. have the manna in her womb. She has the bread which came down from heaven in her womb. And she doesn't have a stick that proves the priesthood. She has the priest in her womb. Mary is wow. the Ark of the New Covenant. All of that congeals together in the visitation. And anybody who has eyes to see and ears to hear and know their Old Testament would see that Mary there, Luke is telling you she's the Ark of the New Covenant. And then we see her at the end of her story when, I'm going to add this now in case we don't get there, where John looks up into heaven and he says, I behold, I looked into the heavens and I saw the woman clothed with the sun of the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars. She's the one that gives birth to the the child who would rule the world with a rod of iron. That's Mary the queen. But right before that verse in chapter 11, whoever divided the chapters up divided it very poorly because it separated those two verses. If you read it the way it was written, it says, behold, I looked up into heaven and I saw the tabernacle of God opened and there was the ark of the covenant, Mary. And behold, yes. I saw the woman, Mary, clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars under her head. There you see the blessed Virgin Mary in heaven as the Ark of the Covenant and as the Queen of Heaven. Now, wow. we're done with the visitation. The so much happens in the visitation, but three months later, she walks all the way back now to, and I made the point, I don't think she went there to help Elizabeth because Elizabeth was rich as a high priest's wife. They would have had servants galore, we think that Mary maybe went there to get away from Nazareth so that she didn't, people didn't start the rumors. And she wanted like a spiritual retreat to go yeah. and have a spiritual retreat with her Aaronic priesthood uncle and our cousins, whoever the relative relations were. Now she's going back to Nazareth and now there's the 30 silent. No, now she goes back. Sorry, getting ahead of myself. She goes back for six months and then they go to Bethlehem to give birth to the baby. Wow. So she, uh, this is interesting because you were talking about uh, she was pregnant. Uh, she would have been showing. Did the wedding happen? Did, did the final part of the ceremony happen yet? We don't know. The Bible doesn't know. tell us. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. But so, um, what, so yeah. let's, let's, the journey to Bethlehem. Um, this is quite interesting too. It wasn't an easy one. And St. Joseph had his, his doubts as well uh, as, as Matthew talks about. He a bit. did. And, and the angel the angel had to come to him. If you read the Gospels with this in mind, it's interesting. Matthew is the story of Jesus's birth from Joseph's perspective. Luke is the story of the nativity from Mary's perspective. In Matthew, wow. you don't see the angel come to Mary, but the angel comes three times to Joseph. In the Gospel of Luke, you never hear about an angel going to Joseph, but you do hear the angel coming to Mary. So Joseph is that Matthew is his story, Mary, Luke is her story. Yeah, interesting. Now, and it says that Joseph was very concerned. Here he's betrothed and he comes and finds out she's pregnant. He knows it's not him and yeah. he doesn't know all of this. I wondered why doesn't Mary tell him what the angels said for heaven's sakes, tell him. But, you know, I think people maybe didn't talk as much back then. You know, us Americans and Australians, we're pretty, we're pretty chatty. <laughs> and, um, but I think back then people may not have been as chatty as we are. So anyway, Joseph is concerned. The angel has to calm him down and say, Joseph, Joseph, don't worry. It's what happened to Mary is done by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph trusted the angel. So, um, we never hear one word of Joseph. He never speaks in the Bible. We just He just does what he's supposed to do. The tall, silent, uh, holy one. You know, he doesn't yeah. ask questions. <laughs> he doesn't argue. He just does what he's supposed to. Go, go do this. Off he goes. <laughs> um, so now they're on their way to Bethlehem. And we know, I like to say this, it took again another seven, ten, five to seven days we don't know she was on a donkey. It doesn't say that. The Proto-Evangelium of James says she was on a donkey, but mm. the, the, the scriptures itself does not. I think they arrived in a donkey traffic jam <laughs> in the intersection. All these people were coming to do the census. All the, the, the inns were full. All the people that had upper levels to rent out, they're all full. And Joseph, now he's got a wife who's pregnant, whether they're married at this point, I would assume they're probably married by this point. And, um, now he's got this girl who's pregnant and nowhere to go. Now, remember 2,000 years earlier or 1,800, 1800 years earlier, a man named Jacob was passing through Nazareth. 
And when he got to Nazareth, his wife, Rachel, gave birth to Benjamin, and she got off the camel, gave birth, and died. Rachel, the one he loved, the beautiful one, he buried her on the side of the road. And Rachel's tomb is still there to this day, 4,000 years later. You can go visit Rachel's tomb. But don't think that when Joseph was coming down that Hebron Road, it's called today, and we take that road from Jerusalem to Bethlehem when we go visit there. Don't think that Joseph, when he's leading the donkey or walking with Mary and she's nine months pregnant and he passed by the tomb of Rachel where his great, 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 great grandmother died giving birth to a baby nine months pregnant. Don't think he didn't look over there and say, oh, please, dear God, take care of Mary. Oh, yeah. Think of the thoughts that would come to your mind if your wife was pregnant and you don't even have a place to take her and you're walking all this way and you see there where your grandmother, your great grandmother matriarch died in childbirth and just think it how that would send a shockwave. People say, oh, well, he didn't have anything to worry about. God was going to take care of him. Don't think that for a minute because even God says, quickly, mm. quickly, get up and go to Egypt. Herod's going to try and kill the baby. That's right. That's right. All so, this is happening and he's, yeah. <laughs> tested. Now, now why go to why go to Bethlehem to give birth to the baby because in Bethlehem the name Bethlehem means house of bread mm. and in Mary's womb is the bread of life. Mary goes to to the house of bread to deliver the bread. First thing she does is puts him in a manger. Why? I think that she puts him in a manger cuz that's a food dish for sheep. And Mary was telling us from the wow. very first action that Jesus is going to become the food of his sheep. We're going bread to eat him. So when you go to the altar for mass next time and you see the altar, think of it as a manger with baby Jesus on it, offering himself up to you to be your food. So now there's so much we could say, Bethlehem, what what happened there? They had to go to Egypt. That's another 250 miles. Where did Joseph get the money for that? They were a poor family. I think he used the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I think that was like a gift that he could turn into liquid cash to finance his trip because they were a poor family. How do I know they're a poor family? Because you're supposed to take a lamb to the um, presentation, presentation of the yes. Lord and the cleansing. Chapter and in Luke, they yeah. have a lamb 40 days after they didn't have enough money for a lamb. Can you believe it? Joseph did not have enough money for a lamb. So they took two turtle doves instead. So they did not have a lot of money. I think they used the frankincense, gold, and myrrh, and they used that to go to to finance their travels. Traveling is expensive. Never thought of that, yeah. Yep. And uh, we always think there's three wise men, but we don't know how many there were. There could have been two. There could have been ten. The only reason we say there's three is because there was three gifts, and we thought we think that each one brought a gift, but there's no indication. There could have been ten wise men. We don't know. Mm, okay, now. What's next, Charbel? So, yeah, I mean, we're talking about Cana as well. So, I mean, you've talked, touched on um, Egypt. We've got 30 silent years of the family life. So, yep. do, I mean, can we imagine just very quickly what would life have been like that, that the Scripture doesn't really give us uh, an insight to? No, but when you know the land and you yep. know the culture, you get a lot of insight into what their life was like. Joseph and Jesus would have probably worked in Sepphoris, which is a city an hour's walk away where the Romans were building a big city there with stone. The word carpenter, tecton. We'll talk about this when we get to Jesus next time. Yes. But it doesn't mean what we think of. It's, it means a, a, somebody that works a grunt, somebody with calluses on their hand, a day laborer, rocks and whatever. And that's what I think they worked with with rocks because they don't have wood around there. They have rocks. So. Oh. That's uh, the word tecton, carpenter. Well, anyway, now Joseph dies somewhere. We The only incident we know of in that 12-year period is when Jesus stays back at the temple at 12 years old, arguing with the best professors in the university there and, and knocking their socks off. They were totally <laughs> surprised by this young whippersnapper who knew more than they did. I always say it's, it's it really helps to be God, but yeah. he was smart. He was smart anyway. Mary and Joseph taught him well. Now, he... They, they find him, and this is interesting because Mary says, why have you done this to your father and I? Joseph was yeah. referred to as his father. Even though he was not biological, he was legal, which that in those days you became the legal son. You, you had all of the benefits of a son born of the flesh, You even the lineage. That's how Jesus, without an earthly, he had an earthly mother without an earthly father, and he was a son of God with an earthly father without a mother. 
But anyway, that's he would have gotten his um, tie in his okay. genealogy from the the throne of Ju the tribe of Judah because that's the kingly throne, the Lion of Judah. That's Jesus. He's from that tribe. So they they live twenty uh, those years together. They bring Jesus back home, and Mary says, "Why did why did you do this to your father and I?" Meaning, showing again, she didn't know everything, but she pondered these things in her heart. Can you imagine losing Jesus? I, I, have you ever lost one of your kids in a in a grocery store or a supermarket yeah, or a yeah. mall and you panic more today than when I when when I was having our kids? You didn't think of pedophiles and all these crazy people that are in the world today. You never thought about oh, that. But yeah. man, you you lose a kid today, even just in one aisle, you panic. Imagine losing the Son of God and three days before you find him. Oh my God, I've lost I've lost God. Um, anyway, so that must have been very distressing. Now, they, after they've been there now, they go to Cana. The meantime, John the Baptist is now down in the Jordan River. And we know right where he was. We can pinpoint the exact place where he is baptizing because of the early church and the Christians and what they did there. And we know that it was not in Israel. It was on the other side of the Jordan and Bethany beyond the Jordan. And on that side, that's where Jesus was baptized. So, John the Baptist is down there proclaiming these things, but it uh, and and you get a little bit um, whether Jesus went and was baptized first and the Spirit came down and then went into the wilderness first, or whether he did his first miracle first. My guess is he may have gone down and been baptized and then gone back up and done his first miracle. But it wouldn't have been it would have been a little anticlimactic then because already his disciples would know about him because of the dove. Yes. Whereas it seems in John chapter two. Um, but it, it had to be after any, in any okay. case, he goes there and, um, there's a whole lot to talk about the baptism of our Lord, but he's baptized and then goes out into the wilderness for the devil to tempt him. But in, in Cana, I think it's another moment of sorrow for Mary on the bus. We talked for 45 minutes on this passage and I only have zero minutes yeah. <laughs> left, but I think there, Mary, <clears throat> she was the intercessor for the people, the wedding guests. And she's also an intercessor today for us. We're also wedding guests to the great feast of the lamb. She interceded then and she intercedes now. And she, in, in the Middle East, and you may know this, I don't know how much you know about your Lebanese culture, but women have a very strong part in the Lebanese culture. And like in the in the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, the woman that they're they're coaching this young girl who's getting married, and they said, "Don't worry about it." You know, the men they think they're so important. They say they're the head, but we women we're the neck, and the neck yeah. tells the head which way to turn. <laughs> and so we we see that the women are very strong there. And Mary came in. The men and women are separate during the weddings. During mm. the whole ceremony, the men sit over here and the women sit over there. Mary went into the men's section and she got Jesus's attention and she said, come here, come here, like this. You know, we always sing the song, gentle woman. Yeah. <laughs> she was anything but gentle. She's a Jewish mother for heaven's sakes. She said, come over here. She said, they have no wine. Jesus says, woman, what does that have to do with you and me? My hour is not yet come. She just ignores him and says, the guys do whatever he tells you. And she walks back out to be with all the women. <laughs> Jesus now, he said, it's not time for his ministry to begin yet. Mom did. Mom just said, yes, he did with, without even saying it. She just said, do whatever he tells you and turns on and walks away. She didn't even answer him. And then he turns the water into wine. Now, I think that that was also a moment of sorrow for Mary because when she said, do whatever he tells you, she knew that no longer was he going to come over the hillside at the end of the day and have dinner with her and say night prayers with her and fall asleep on the mats in their cave. And she didn't have him to herself anymore to feed him until she loved her son. And when she said, do whatever he tells you, she knew he was now going to leave to follow his heavenly father. And she gave him away. And I think she had tears in her eyes when she looked at him and said, turned away and said, do whatever he tells you. I think she was weeping when she said that because wow. she was saying goodbye to her son. That's profound. So that, that is the wedding of Canaan. Now we go through the whole ministry of Christ. It says there were women who followed Jesus everywhere, taking care of him. Luke tells us that. They come finally, eventually we come to Jerusalem and, there, and there's so much to say, but we'll just kind of move through this. The fathers of the church taught that 
Mary was the second Eve, because we know from 1 Corinthians 15, we'll talk about this next month, that Jesus is the second Adam or the last Adam. We have a Adam in a garden who brought damnation and sin, screwed everything up. We have a new Adam coming now, going into a new garden. So yes. where's the new Eve? If Adam and Eve were the first and Jesus is the last Adam, where's the last Eve? Well, Mary is the last Eve. And the fathers of the church taught that Eve in the garden, she tied the knot of sin. But Mary, she untied the knot of sin. She cooperated in the redemption, and she was there at the foot of the cross. In John's gospel, she's mentioned at the beginning of Jesus's ministry, do whatever he tells you, and at the very end of his ministry, when he says, this is now John, take care of her, she's my mother, which also tells you that Mary didn't have any other children, because if she did, son number two would be in charge of taking care of her, but because there was no son number two, Jesus had cousins or other relatives, but no sons of Mary. Mary had to have somebody take care of her or she would be destitute. Jesus didn't care about himself on the cross. He was worried about his mother. And he said, mother, you don't have any other children, other sons. So John, you are going to become her son. And that shows wow. right there that Mary was ever virgin. If you know the context, the culture, the people, yes. the families, how things were, the Bible comes open and like a, tech, a widescreen technicolor. Well, I'm watching the clock here. We've got 6.55. Um, after the crucifixion, Mary, we don't hear about her again. I'm assuming she was there to see him raised from the dead, maybe the first one. That would be appropriate. But the next time we see her mentioned is in the upper room. Yes. Why does it Mary mention in the upper room? says that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. How many were in the upper room? I'm not going to put you on the spot. I asked well, it, people. It would have been uh, 11 or 12. Was, was, was Matthias selected yet? Matthias was. Um, Matthias. He, he was, they all gathered in the upper room. And while he was there, they, they did choose him, Matthias. But there were 120 altogether. Okay. The 11 were there, and then we added number 12 with Matthias. But it says, and also Mary, the, there were others there, but Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. Why do they tell yeah. us that she's there? First of all, 120 in the upper room. I should save this for next time. But that's because in Jewish tradition, if you wanted to leave a major city and start your own, you needed a minimum of 120 people to leave and go start your own new community. What is wow. the church? They're being called out to start their own community. And it's not just a fellowship of brothers and sisters. Hey, Charbel, you love Jesus too. Hey, we're the church, man. We yeah. get together, pray. That's the church. No, no. The church was a government. You were 120, you could leave and you could go start your own courts and your own Sanhedrin, have your own new city. It's a civic authority. And wow. the church was a new civic governmental authority with legislature and judicial. That's what the church is. It's not a fellowship of believers. It is the church. It's what the Catholic church is today. Mary was there because happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. The <laughs> Pentecost is the birthday of the church. Yes. And in order for the baby to be born, the mother has to be there. Mary wow. is the mother of the church. The church yes. is the mystical body of Christ. How can you have the mystical body of Christ being born without the mother there to be in laboring in prayer to bring about the body of Christ? Amazing. Yes. And she's also there because the Jews were afraid. It says of the Romans, but I think they're also afraid of God. The only thing they knew about fire coming down on a mountain was Mount Sinai, and they were terrified back then, and they were terrified of God coming down on a mountain. And you say he's going to come down on Mount Zion. He's going to come down in fire. <gasps> oh, boy. And Mary says, guys, relax. Be calm. He's already overshadowed me. Nothing but pure joy and love. Just relax. <laughs> Don't worry. Mary had to be there to keep these guys calm. It always takes women some time to keep us men in line. Well, I'm going to go very quickly from there. She moves in with John. It says that she, John took her into his own home. So she lived with John and James because John and James lived together in the same house. Can you imagine how your life would be different, how you would live your life differently if Mary was living there with you all day? Absolutely. <laughs> it would change the way you live. No wonder those yeah. guys became saints. Yeah. Now, so now Mary lives with them. She goes to Ephesus for a while. I'm going to wrap this up pretty quick here. Uh, we could do another hour on the second half, but we'll do it fast. Amazing. The end of Mary's life. She goes to Ephesus with John. It would have been a very grueling trip. Unbelievably grueling. Whether you walked all the way up through Lebanon of today and Syria yep. and Turkey, all the way over to the western there. coast of 
or they went on a ship, which would have been, they didn't have cruise ships back then. They were cargo ships and you had to rent space on the deck and bring your own food and your own tent. And you lived on the deck of the ship. And if there's a storm, you're just out in it because there were no cabins down below. And if you had to go to the bathroom, you sat on the bow and put your butt over the side of the boat. So either way, Mary went, it was rough. Wow. So she's in Ephesus for a while. There's a house in Ephesus. I'm going to be there in October with a group. We have mass at Mary's house. But then she, I think in 49 AD, Acts chapter 15, she came back with John to Jerusalem. There was a council in Jerusalem and the apostles came back. I think the daughter of Zion returned to Mount Zion. She would have been about 70 years old at that point. She was not subject to death, but she chose death to conform to the image of her son and to be a first fruits for us to be taken up body and soul. She, She fell asleep. The church doesn't say whether she died or fell asleep, but John Paul II and most others said that she did die and that she was died on the top of Mount Zion. There's a church there called the Dormition of Mary with a statue yes. of her laying dead. Then they buried her in the Kidron Valley. And in the Kidron Valley today, there's a Greek Orthodox church called the Church of the Tomb of Mary, also the Church of the Ascension. She was buried there. The apostles came back to prepare her further and she was gone. She had been taken to heaven. Now, when you get to Revelation, John sees her in heaven there. And that is the tradition of the church, that she was taken up into heaven. The church that the church defined that dogmatically, that yes. Mary was assumed. The difference between ascension, like Jesus, he ascended, Mary was assumed. Ascension is when you go up with your own rocket pack. <laughs> you go mm-hmm. up. Assumed is when someone has to bring you up. Mary is not God. She's not an angel. She's a human being. And Jesus reached down and took her. Last thing, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 19. Solomon, the son of David. Jesus is the son of David. Solomon, the son of David. First thing he did as a king, his mother walked into his throne room. He bowed down to his mother. Then he built a throne at his right hand. Now there's two thrones of in the kingdom of Israel, two thrones, one for the king and one for the king's mother, not his wife, his mother. From then on, every king of Israel had a queen of Judea, especially of the line of Solomon. Every king had a queen and the queen was always the mother. So if Solomon is going to descend and condescend to bring his mother up and seat her at his right hand, what do you think the new son of David, who's going to be much better than the first son of David, is going to do for his mother? Raise her up to become his queen. That's why Mary's the queen of heaven. So we got all the way from Jerusalem to heaven in an hour. (laughs) Right on. Amazing. Uh, Spot on. Thank you so much. Well, it is amazing. She is the queen mother, our mother, mother of the church, mother of this kingdom, and uh, phenomenal stuff. Um, all is in this DVD. So you've got all the details. You're in the Holy Land. You're going through all this. It's a, it's, it's a solid amount in here, um, 78 minutes worth of, of time there of all this actual footage there. Love it. Love your energy. Love how you bring it to life. And, and there's uh, a study guide in there too, Charbel. That's the right. study guide covers the things that we just talked about. It's tied to the Bible and the catechism. So you can go through that. It follows the script of the movie. So you can follow all of this in the scriptures and in the catechism, and you can learn Brilliant. it too. And then Brilliant. you can so get a copy. We are doing a special on this. Uh, during this whole nine months um, pilgrimage, 20% off any one of these or the whole set. If you get it, um, it's PP for Peruse Your Podcast, SR for Steve Ray, and FOG for Footprints of God. So P-P-S-R-F-O-G, that's your code, and you'll get automatically 20% off the, the, the DVDs. Also, 2022, put your names down. Uh, contact us. Um, we're going to the Holy Land with Steve Ray, and uh, very, very excited about that. So things are opening up uh, early next year, and then we hope to build up uh, enough of us to, to, to fill two buses. Let's try to do that in 2022. Um, and we want to bring Americans, Australians, uh, New Zealanders, you know, anyone who's willing to to come with us, uh, Perusia, joining forces with Harvest Journeys and um, Steve Ray. So very excited. I hope excited. it's all Austrians. I ho- Austrians. Yeah, let's fill it with Aussies. <laughs> and I'm trying. I'm trying to learn your accent. Maybe if I am with you for ten days, I'll learn it as good as you guys. Can. That's right. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Steve. Looking forward. Next time we see you, you will actually be part of the Advent pilgrimage, uh, yep. which we've just announced. Uh, at looking at um, Abraham there, when you do amazing job. And, of course, we'll have you in the next part of the series, which will also be within that pilgrimage time frame, uh, a live show on Jesus. So looking forward to talking about that as well. Perfect timing. Sounds good.
Thanks, Charbel. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, uh, for all the updates. Go to catholicconvert.com and, of course, everything at perusia, perusiamedia.com. 